After raising my sister when our parents walked away, she turned her back on me and didn't invite me to her wedding. Her fiance learned the truth and cancelled everything. I'm Danny now 34, and my deep-seated anguish stems mainly from two sources, my parents and my older brother Alex, who is now 38. Our parents, a nurse named Janet and an electrician named Mark, were ordinary in every way except one, their blatant favoritism towards Alex. This favoritism painted the canvas of our childhood with unequal strokes, favoring him with brighter, more vibrant colors while leaving my portion dim and faded. Growing up in the modest town of Elmswood, where everyone knew everyone else's business, didn't help. Our small close-knit community often amplified the discrepancies between Alex and me, as if under a magnifying glass. At school events, neighborhood gatherings, and even in the grocery store, I was Alex's brother, a shadow trailing behind the more illustrious elder sibling. From the earliest days I can recall, Alex was the golden child. Birthdays which should have been a celebration of life, were the first battlegrounds of favoritism. In my 10th birthday, which fell on a chilly but cheerful October day, I was excited about the party planned at our house, yet, even this day was co-opted by Alex, as our parents had let him decide the theme. He chose superheroes, knowing full well I preferred dinosaurs. He smirked as he paraded around in a Superman cape, while I sulked in a corner, my T-Rex costume feeling suddenly out of place and childish. Christmas was no different. Each year Alex would be the first to dive under the tree, his hands tearing through wrapping paper on gifts that often turned out to be the latest gadgets or toys, things he wanted. My gifts were often practical clothes, books or worse, items clearly meant for older kids, which Alex would end up claiming anyway. The injustice of it was like a stone in my shoe, constant and irksome. Our parents seemed blind to the imbalance, or perhaps they chose to be. They praised Alex's every achievement, no matter how minor, and offered excuses for his failures. In contrast my achievements were met with nods or polite smiles, and my failures were proof of laziness or lack of talent. This disparity extended beyond gifts and celebrations. At dinner, Alex would talk about his day, his plans his friends, and our parents absorbed every word with eager attention. When it was my turn, their eyes would glaze over, as if they were waiting for a commercial break to end, and the main program to resume. This pattern of neglect had a profound effect on me. It ingrained in me a sense of unworthiness and a conviction that I was inherently less lovable than my brother. These feelings were compounded by the whispers of pity, or the comparisons drawn by neighbors and family friends, always noting how different Alex and I were, and not in my favor. As we grew older, the chasm widened. High school brought new challenges, bullying being one of them. I was an easy target, not just for my peers but, it seemed for fate itself. Alex ever the charmer was popular and athletic. He excelled in sports and had a wide circle of friends. I on the other hand, was bookish and introverted often bullied for my quiet nature and the hand-me-downs I wore, many of which had started off as Alex's. One particularly painful memory was during our shared high school years when I was 15 and Alex 19. It was the day of the school's annual talent show, an event I had been eagerly anticipating because I was to perform a piano piece I had spent months perfecting. I remember walking onto the stage, the nerves dancing in my stomach, only to see Alex in the front row, surrounded by his friends, sneering up at me. Mid-performance, a loud obnoxious heckle from his direction broke my concentration. I faltered my fingers tripping over keys in a discordant tumble. The audience's laughter stung worse than any physical blow. After the show my parents comforted Alex, who feigned innocence and claimed his friends were the culprits. My humiliation it seemed, was of no consequence. This dynamic persisted into our adulthood. I watched as Alex, armed with a business degree paid for by our parents, climbed the corporate ladder with ease. In contrast, I struggled through community college, juggling jobs to pay for my education, earning a degree in computer science through sheer grit and determination. It wasn't just in the realm of education or personal achievements that the inequality showed. Even in matters of the heart, I felt the sting of our parents' indifference. When I came out as gay at 22, the news was met with a stony silence from my parents, and a cruel jibe from Alex about not wanting to share a room during family holidays for safety. The pain of that remark was sharper, because it went unchallenged by our parents. Now, standing on the threshold of midlife, I find myself dredging up these memories not out of a desire to wallow in past grievances but because fate has presented a cruel irony. Alex, the brother who made my childhood a living hell, is now battling a terminal illness. To know more about my story, and why my brother got sick, let's go back about two months ago. I experienced one of the few moments in my life when I felt genuinely cared for and protected. But it came at a steep price, the death of my grandparents. Their passing marked a significant shift in my life, highlighting the contrast between their loving support and the glaring neglect from my parents. My grandparents had always been my sanctuary. Unlike my parents, who invariably showered my older brother with attention and gifts, my grandparents provided me with something far more profound, unconditional love and acceptance. They were aware of the imbalance in my family, and they did everything within their power to make me feel valued. Whenever I visited them, it was like stepping into a world where I was no longer invisible. They listened intently to my stories about school and my small achievements, 
which my parents often overlooked in favor of celebrating my brother's latest successes. Growing up the difference in how my grandparents and my parents treated my brother and me was stark. Unlike my parents, who clearly favored my older brother, my grandparents showered both of us with love and affection, though it always felt like they made an extra effort to compensate for the imbalance at home. My grandparents were the kind of people who believed in fairness and equality. They often tried to gently advise my parents to treat us equally, hoping to bridge the gap that was so apparent. Treat the boys fairly, they both deserve your love and support, they would say in their calm wise tones. Despite these conversations, which I overheard more than once, my parents' behavior remained unchanged. Their favoritism towards my brother was as clear as ever, and their ears seemed closed to any suggestion of impartiality. The love from my grandparents was demonstrated in their actions and the small everyday moments. They were always present at my school events, cheering just as loudly for me as for my brother if not louder, to make up for my parents' often lukewarm enthusiasm for my achievements. On birthdays, they went out of their way to make sure my gifts and cake were just as grand as what my brother received, if not more so to subtly balance the scales. Their passing was not only a profound loss of love and support, but also marked the end of the only advocacy I had within my family. It underscored just how much they had done to protect and elevate me, efforts that were both subtle and significant. They knew the challenges I faced and tried in their own ways to shield me, even if it meant standing up to their own children. The day we lost them was a quietly tragic one. They had been involved in a minor car accident, but due to their frail health, they couldn't recover. It happened too quickly, and suddenly I was left without my pillars of emotional support. At the funeral, while everyone else seemed to be whispering about wills and legacies, I was engulfed in a deep sense of loss, mourning not just their death but the unconditional love they took with them. The reading of the will was a somber affair and it was there that I learned about the final act of protection my grandparents had orchestrated for me. To everyone's surprise they had left me their house and a substantial sum of money. $500,000. It was an unexpected turn of events that caused a stir among my relatives, particularly my parents, who had expected that everything would go to my brother, as it always had. However the most dramatic revelation was yet to come. My grandparents had always known about the preferential treatment my brother received and the manipulative tendencies of my parents. To protect me further and perhaps teach everyone a lesson about values and deception, they had included a peculiar clause about another sum of money. This was the money my brother believed he was receiving. A hefty amount supposedly hidden in a special envelope. But in reality, this envelope contained nothing but monopoly money. I remember that moment. My parents, who had always shown blatant favoritism towards him, practically glowed with vicarious satisfaction. Their joy was palpable as if they themselves had won some grand lottery. They whispered excitedly among themselves, already planning how this windfall would bolster our family's finances. Perhaps they did not consider but secretly hoped that my brother would share some of his newfound wealth with them. But the joy of the moment was tainted for me. Standing on the periphery, I watched my brother's face light up with greedy anticipation as he tore open the envelope. His voice, dripping with condescension and unearned triumph, cut through the merriment like a knife. Finally something to show for all my patience with this family, he smirked, his eyes not meeting mine as if I were beneath his notice. It wasn't enough that he had received what should have been my share as well, he had to twist the knife. I guess this means I can finally get away from all this. Especially you, he sneered, his gaze flicking over me dismissively. The sting of his words was sharp, made all the more painful by my then ignorance that the money was fake. At the time I believed he had received a real fortune, a fortune that could have transformed my life, which had been anything but privileged compared to his. The dreams I had nurtured in secret, of freedom, of modest comfort, of simply being seen as equal seemed to crumble before my eyes. I felt a deep sinking regret, not only for the loss of what I thought was my last chance at a better life, but for the bitter divide that money had reinforced between us. His words about my identity were perhaps the most cutting. Ever since I had come out as non-binary, my brother had used every opportunity to belittle and insult me, as if my existence challenged his overly traditional views. Don't expect me to waste any of this cleaning up your messes, he'd say scornfully, using the wrong pronouns deliberately to sting. Imagine being so desperate to be different you end up like that. His mockery was a clear reflection of the disdain he felt, mirroring the less overt but equally painful dismissal by our parents. To everyone's surprise, especially our parents, my brother did not linger to celebrate his windfall. The very next day he packed up, his actions as cold and calculated as his departure. He moved in with his girlfriend, who unbeknownst to him, was more interested in his supposed financial status than in him as a person. Our parents, left in the wake of his sudden departure, were stunned. All those years of prioritizing him, of bending family dynamics to favor him, had culminated not in grateful reciprocation but in abandonment. Their faces, once flushed with excitement, now mirrored the betrayal they felt, a bitter realization that their golden child had fled the nest with no intention of looking back. However, the truth revealed itself dramatically. Days later in the wake of my brother's sudden departure to his girlfriend's place, I received a call from him, the first in what would be a series of frantic, increasingly humbled communications. The money was fakey, monopoly money, 
precisely placed in a real bank envelope. The girlfriend driven by material aspirations, had unceremoniously kicked him out upon discovering the deceit. My brother, now homeless and humiliated, was suddenly devoid of both the financial windfall he had bragged about and the companion he had chosen over his family. This revelation did not soften my heart, rather it crystallized the resentment that had been simmering for years. When he showed up at my door, his face a mix of anger and desperation, I felt a cold resolve wash over me. This was the brother who had tormented me throughout my childhood, who had stood by and watched, or instigated, as others did the same. This was the brother who had never once stood up for me, not when I was bullied for being different, not when I struggled to find my place in the world. When my brother showed up at my doorstep, it wasn't a simple knock of desperation. It was the culmination of a series of events that had folded since he'd been duped by the monopoly money our grandparents had cleverly disguised as inheritance. According to what he told me, before he decided to come here, he had gone to our parents' house seeking refuge and possibly some financial support. However the reception he received there was far from what he had hoped. Our parents had always preferred him over me, showering him with attention and gifts throughout our childhood. Yet, when he appeared on their doorstep in his hour of need, they turned him away. They believed he had squandered the money, or what he thought was money, on lavish expenditures or perhaps on his girlfriend, who was notorious for her interest in material wealth. He explained that our parents accused him of lying about the money being fake. They thought he was just making up stories to get more financial aid from them. The disappointment was evident in their voices. They felt betrayed that he had not only moved out so abruptly after receiving his inheritance, but had also neglected them since moving in with his girlfriend. In their eyes he had chosen his new life over family, only to return when he was in trouble. At that time I was staying at our grandparents' house. I was taking care of the house, living quietly away from the drama that often surrounded my parents and brother. The house was a sanctuary from the childhood memories of neglect and favoritism that still haunted me. When my brother recounted his ordeal, there was a part of me that felt a twinge of sympathy. Here he was, the favored child, who had never once considered the impact of his actions or words on others, particularly me, now reduced to seeking help from the sibling he had often ridiculed and scorned. His fall from grace was steep, and his current predicament was a harsh lesson in humility. However, the years of being second best, of enduring his cruel taunts and our parents' obvious partiality, had hardened my heart considerably. He spoke of our parents' rejection with a tone of surprise and hurt, as if it was unthinkable that they would ever turn their backs on him. It was ironic, really considering how often he had done the same to me, both as a child and as an adult. But his narrative was filled with regret and a sense of urgency, but it lacked genuine remorse for the way he had treated me over the years. It seemed he was more upset about his loss of comfort and status than about the possibility of mending our fractured relationship. As he stood there, looking more vulnerable than I had ever seen him, I was faced with a choice. Could I set aside the years of neglect? the memories of birthdays and Christmases where I watched him open presents that should have been mine, was I capable of forgiving not just him, but also our parents, who had instilled such disparity between us. I listened quietly, my mind raced memories and emotions. In the end my response was shaped not just by the hurt of the past but by the realization of what I needed to do to protect my own peace. I had built a life for myself here in our grandparents' house, a life away from the constant reminders of my secondary place in our family. Years have passed since I shut the door on my brother. And in that time, the details of his life have faded into a distant haze. I don't know where he lives, nor have I kept up with his goings-on. That is, until today when a sudden text message broke the silence between us, tearing open old wounds with news of his illness. He was sick, battling a brain tumor, and frequently in and out of the hospital. He couldn't afford the surgery fees and was reaching out for help, but it struck a chord deep within me. It was not just a request for financial aid. It was a plea for familial support the kind he had denied me throughout our childhood and well into our adult lives. Memories of our past, of his harsh words and cruel actions, surged back with unwelcome clarity. He had always been the favored son, the golden child who received the latest gadgets and unwavering affection from our parents, while I lingered in the shadows, the afterthought in their familial narrative. Now, as he lay in a hospital bed, vulnerable and reaching out, those same feelings wrestled within me once again. Could I deny him help when he was possibly facing the end of his life? Was my resentment so deep that I could look away from a dying man, my own brother, regardless of our torrid past? As I pondered over his request, the scenes of our childhood played in my mind like a melancholy film. There were moments when he could have stood up for me, moments when he could have shared, moments when he could have simply been the brother I needed him to be. But those moments never came. Instead, there were insults, there were dismissals, and above all, there was the clear message that I was less than him unworthy of the same love and attention he received so freely. His words from our last encounter echoed in my memory. Where were you when I was being bullied? Where were you when I lost my job? Where were you when I got married to my husband? Each question is a stark reminder of his absence, of his choice to exclude me, to ridicule me for who I was. And now, he needed me. Now, when everyone else had turned their backs, when his charm and money had run out, he remembered that he had a brother. I sat with the weight of his request, feeling the old wounds bleed anew. Was I a bad person for hesitating, 
for wanting to turn him away as he had done to me. Perhaps. But forgiveness is a complex dance, one that requires more than desperation to lead its steps. As I wrestled with my conscience, I realized that my decision would not just define his fate but would shape the narrative of who I wanted to be in the face of such profound betrayal. In the end I chose to respond. My message was simple devoid of the bitterness that had colored our last encounter. I hope you find the help you need I wrote. It was neither a commitment, nor a refusal, but a boundary set firmly in place. I could not erase the past, nor could I rewrite the hurt that had been inflicted. But I could choose how to move forward, not with malice or resentment, but with the quiet dignity of someone who had learned to value themselves in the absence of familial love. As I sent the message, a sense of relief washed over me. I had responded not out of spite, but from a place of strength. Whether he would interpret it as an act of compassion or indifference did not concern me. I had offered what I could, a gesture of peace to ease my conscience, and perhaps mend a bridge long left in disrepair. In stepping back I found my peace, realizing that being a good person doesn't always mean having to fix everything. Sometimes, it simply means doing what you can, with respect for yourself and the history that shaped you. You know one thing, that happened that I could have predicted was my parents' reaction, when they found out I refused to help my brother. Their first approach was through a series of phone calls. I recognized the familiar numbers flashing on my phone screen, and I knew immediately that answering would lead to nothing but a rehash of old grievances and criticisms. So, I chose silence, letting the calls go unanswered. But silence was not a strong enough barrier, it merely postponed the confrontation. One afternoon, I heard the determined knocking at my door. Reluctantly, I opened it to find my parents standing there, their faces a mix of anger and desperation. The initial exchange was as bitter as I had anticipated. How could you turn your back on your own brother at a time like this? My father began, his voice thick with disapproval. My mother chimed in, her words laced with a familiar disdain, and to think we raised you better, even with your choices. The slight pause before choices, and the emphasis thereafter made it clear she was referring to my sexuality, a topic they had never fully accepted. As the minutes dragged on, their anger seemed to dissolve somewhat into a pleading desperation. He's your brother, he needs your help my mother implored, her ease welling up with tears, not just for my brother, I suspected, but for the shattered image of a united family she held dear. I stood firm, though not without inner turmoil. Look I started my voice steadier than I felt. I understand he's in a tough spot, but why am I always the one expected to make sacrifices? Where was this family unity when I needed support? When I was bullied, ignored, marginalized? There was no satisfying answer to those questions, and we all knew it. The room filled with a tense silence, a tacit acknowledgement of the many times they had failed to stand by me. Then the conversation turned to the house and the inheritance left by my grandparents, the only real support I had known. My parents knew about the house my grandparents had bequeathed me, intended as a safeguard and a gesture of love, acknowledging the imbalance I had endured throughout my life. It's a large sum, and the house is valuable. I sighed, feeling the weight of the decision. This house is more than just property to me, it's a memorial of the only people who ever made me feel valued and loved. It's not just a matter of money, it's about preserving the one good thing I inherited from a past filled with inequality. I explained, hoping they would understand the depth of what they were asking me to relinquish. The plea turned into more whining and bargaining, but I saw through the desperation to the same old patterns. My parents wanted a resolution that would ease their guilt and discomfort, without true consideration for what it would cost me, both emotionally and financially. I'm at a crossroads, truly. Part of me wants to rise above the past hurts and help my brother, who, despite everything, is in genuine need. Yet, another part of me resists, fueled by years of being sidelined and undervalued. This house, my refuge, symbolizes so much more than a financial asset. It represents my grandparents' recognition of my worth and their desire to protect me even in death. So here I am, asking for your opinion, torn between the desire to be better than what I endured and the need to protect the legacy that is truly mine. What should I do?